that was very rare for a pirate to be able to have a large ship like that. A pirate captain would have to be extremely successful and extremely wealthy. Hello, my name is Dr. Rebecca Simon, and I'm a historian of the Golden Age of Piracy from the time period of approximately 1650 to 1730 within the Caribbean and along the coast of North America. Today, we'll be looking at pirate battles in movies and TV and judge how real they are. A really interesting detail is that the first pirate who comes in, he's got these teeth that look like they're filed into points and makes himself look really, really dangerous and really terrifying. And this was actually a pretty common tactic pirates used. Reportedly, Edward Teach, commonly known as Blackbeard, he would do this by putting sparklers and candles in his hair and beard. So smoke would be coming up from his head to make it look like he came out of hell. <laughs> I, I love this battle clip because it shows a lot of the chaos that happens in a pirate battle, but also the organization. The captain of their pirate ship is Captain Flint. He looks at the captain of the merchant ships and says, wouldn't you agree? The battle is done. And this is basically telling him it's time to surrender. You'll notice that no one was really dying in this battle. Pirate battles sometimes are often over-dramatized. The attacks were actually very quick and almost orderly. Pirates just wanted to get in, steal what they could, and get out as quickly as possible with as few casualties as possible, with the exception of a few particularly violent ones. I'll give this clip a seven. Moment to relearn the basics with one leg. Ideally, we would love to have a pirate who was a skilled swordsman. But the reality is most pirates did not have fighting backgrounds. They were people who had once been merchants or they'd been fishermen or maybe they'd been captured. And so pirates didn't really fight with swords. Instead, they would fight with a cutlass. You can see the tip of it is curved upward and you hold it kind of down by your hip and you thrust it. It's not as large as a sword, so it's not going to be nearly as cumbersome, which is good because you don't need to really practice as much footwork. We do see in, our, in this scene in Our Flags Means Death, he is using a cutlass. And the way he's fighting is very accurate. Perhaps I could learn at the feet of one of the greats. We see that Israel Hands is pointing out that he has a prosthetic leg. This wasn't too uncommon. Injuries were very common on any ship, but particularly a pirate ship where you're fighting quite often. You would get severely injured to the point where it would need amputation, whether it's because of the severity of the injury or because of infection, which was more common. They wouldn't be quite as detailed as Israel Hands was. You're in the field. Three men running you from there, there, and there. Fire! Oh, hit something. He's giving Steve Bonnet some lessons, and the reason he's doing this is because in the show, Steve Bonnet doesn't know anything about piracy or how to be a pirate. That's actually very true to life. Uh, Steve Bonnet was not a pirate, Initially, he was a planter from Barbados, and literally one day he decided to leave his wife, leave his children, leave his plantation, and he went and bought a ship, hired a crew, and became a pirate. But he was very inept at it. Oh, I love you. I love you. The whole relationship between him and Blackbeard is completely fiction, a thousand percent fiction. In reality, Blackbeard and Steve Bonnet did not have a good relationship. They were not friends. He only really joined up with Steed Bonnet in order to have a second ship in his fleet and also because Steed Bonnet was very, very wealthy. But in general, did romantic relationships exist on pirate ships? This is very murky. The weapons that they would use, that was done very well. Then I would probably give that maybe a 9 out of 10. In terms of what actually happened in history about Blackbeard being ousted and having a relationship with Steed Bonnet, um, that is a 0 out of 10. That just did not happen. We're going to steal the ship. We're going to commandeer that ship, Nautical Town. Captain Jack Sparrow and Will Turner are trying to steal the Interceptor. Pirates would do this. Pirates would steal ships and they're going after a big naval ship. Now, that's not particularly accurate. A naval ship is huge. It's going to be very well armed and very well protected. They went for ships that would carry goods that they could sell or get money or get riches pretty quickly which meant they went for merchant ships for the most part. But it's pretty much impossible for just two pirates to be able to do that. You would need an entire crew. 
This is either madness or brilliance. So no pirate in their right mind is going to try to capture a ship by swimming towards it. In fact, believe it or not, a lot of sailors couldn't swim or they couldn't swim well and they were afraid to go into the water. Everyone stay calm. We are taking over the ship. I of us! The Captain Jack Sparrow's outfit is pretty iconic. This is actually not too uncommon for pirates and also lots of working class sailors to wear. The white tunic is going to be pretty durable. It's also very light. You're in the Caribbean. It's hot. It's humid. And another big thing to note, of course, is his hat, the pirate hat. This is called the tricorn hat. This became kind of standard wear for a lot of people who might be the head of a military or the captain of a naval ship. And pirate captains would wear them as well to kind of show their status. I'm Captain Jack Sparrow. He's heavy. So Captain Jack Sparrow is using a gun called a flintlock pistol. And this is a general pistol, what many pirates would have. So the way you operate a flintlock pistol is they're not very accurate to use. Between every shot, you have to reload your flintlock. First, you you have to put in the little bullet. You take um, kind of a stick and you punch it in. And then you have to take your gunpowder in a little bag, rip it open, often with your teeth. You have to be able to do this in seconds in battle. So yes, it's very realistic for Captain Jack Sparrow to use it. People are going to be using guns to as a way to threaten their victims into submission. Do you see when they're using grappling hooks to capture the other ship that's actually quite accurate and what it does it prevents the ship from being able to sail away without dragging the other ship along with it and it gets you close enough so you can get onto from one ship to another using ropes um i'm not sure if that was very common they might use planks of wood to be able to get across but a rope would kind of those could snap you could fall back into the water but it looks a lot more swashbuckling for a film sure. according to the code of the order of the record your return to shore was not part of our negotiations nor our agreement, so I must do nothing. Pirates did negotiate, believe it or not. They sometimes would negotiate with civilians um, if they captured fishing ships. Give us all your goods and we'll let you go. That's usually what they would do. You must be a pirate for the pirate's code to apply, and you're not. And thirdly, the code is more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. So she's referring to what is known as the pirate's code of honor, or what was more commonly known as the articles. So the pirate articles were an actual set of laws and regulations that pirates followed. And you couldn't really be an official pirate unless you swore on the articles, literally almost like swearing on a Bible. It determines how many goods are getting distributed equally amongst the crew. So what he's saying is that the pirate code only applies to pirates. That's true. You have to be a pirate if you want the code to be able to protect you. The Black Pearl is really iconic in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. It was probably the size of what people might refer to as a man of war ship, you know, with the amount of cannons it has and the size it has and the size of a crew it requires. That was very rare for a pirate to be able to have a large ship like that. A pirate captain would have to be extremely successful and extremely wealthy. The vast majority of pirates sailed what were called sloops, which were small ships, single level ships that maybe would have like three to five cannons if they were lucky. So that is a pretty good example of a very chaotic pirate battle scene. In terms of using cannonballs to shoot at a ship, that was usually kind of a last resort that a lot of ships would do, or if they really intended to sink that ship immediately. Because cannonballs are going to cause massive damage very, very quickly. So cannons are used when you mean business, just like it was done in this scene. You see Kira Knightley and you see Anna Maria, played by Zoe Saldana. And they're, that's pretty accurate. There were women on pirate ships. We don't know how many, but it's cool that Disney actually does include that. And also, they do a great job with the crew. Because if you look, you can see the crew is extremely diverse. You have people of color, you have British people, and this is very accurate to what a typical pirate ship would be in during the golden age of piracy. 
we see Captain Barbosa with a pet monkey on his shoulder, kind of throughout. A lot of sailors and pirates might have pets on a ship. And if they're sailing through places like the Caribbean, they're probably going to have more exotic animals. Exotic birds were found on ships. They usually like to have a cat because there would always be rats on a ship and a cat would take care of that problem. Disney employs a lot of movie magic in the scenes here, but something I appreciate about Disney is their attention to detail. So I would give it an eight out of 10. And now, which will it be? The pen or the plane? Damn it! Get it out! Peter Pan uh, has a lot of fun elements about pirates in this movie, Captain Hook being the ultimate antagonist of the film. It was very common for pirates to actually capture victims in battle and then take them onto the ship. And they would sometimes capture entire groups of people. And they were usually in order to get the, to try to force them into their crew. So that way the pirates could have a larger crew. So to see the Lost Boys rounded up on the ship like this, kind of taken as hostages um, until... The, the ideally would agree to become a pirate. That itself is pretty accurate. Wendy, Wendy. And it, what's interesting is we see that Wendy is being punished, and so they're having her walk the plank. And this is something we see quite common in novels, TV shows, or movies about pirates. This is pretty fiction. I've never come across any source that mentioned walking the plank, they're not going to throw anyone overboard because that could be someone who could potentially work for them. I would give this probably a 7 out of 10. Roll on his face! Be you standing for Captain McGain? The antagonist here, Captain Long John Silver, this is where we also get kind of the stereotypical pirate accent of our matey. And the actor was a Cornish actor named... Robert Newton from Cornwall, England, and he basically used his own natural accent and then really hammed it up, kind of basing it on other sa local sailors' accents. So basically, it's just an exaggerated version of a Cornwall accent. Pirate accents wasn't a unique thing. A pirate accent was just wherever the pirate was from. Many were working class, so they would have a bit more of kind of a Cockney-ish style accent, kind of like what we see. But Again, this accent was made up for the movie, but it, again, it's become synonymous of what we've seen. Bearing a point to the north. There she be! Come on! Now, pirates didn't go after buried treasure because there was no buried treasure to go after. Pirates would get goods, and then they would sell them and, and get cash, and then they'd spend their money on land and then go back to pirating when the money ran out. But there's loads of rumors about buried treasure, and this goes back to the time of Captain Kidd, in set who was executed in 1701, he said that he buried a whole bunch of treasure off the coast of New York on an island called Gardner's Island. And he did this as a way to try to see if he could bribe his way out of being condemned as a pirate. But nothing was ever found. But to this day, people still are trying to look for it. So buried treasure is very fictional. But partly because of that and because of Treasure Island, we see this very much all through pirate pop culture. In reality, pirates were after things they could sell, like textiles, spices, wine, sometimes enslaved people. If there was cash on board, that was a bonus. The other goods they wanted were things to replenish their own stores. Food, water, other forms of alcohol like rum, medicines, ship supplies. Give Treasure Island a 2 out of 10 just based on the fact that there was no stereotypical accent and that the big thing is pirates were not going after buried treasure. There were no secret treasure map. Sir, she is still closing. We simply cannot outrun her. During this time period, we see the increase of the use of what's called the Jolly Roger or the black flag. Most pirate flags were often designed by the pirates themselves or their captain. The skull and crossbones isn't synonymous with piracy. Skull and crossbones just simply symbolize death. So the way pirates captured ships is what they would do is they'd see a ship in the distance and they would hail it, which means they would fly a flag. What they would often do is they would fly it as a distress signal. So that way the ship they wanted would start sailing towards them and their ship is also sailing towards that ship. And when the ship is too close to the pirate ship to be able to sail away quickly, the pirates will switch out the flag for a black flag called the Jolly Roger. And the black flag was what pirates used to show that they were going to attack. It was pretty rare 
for there to be a significant pirate fleet. Bartholomew Roberts was probably the most infamous pirate during the Golden Age of Piracy in the 1720s. He had a fleet of many ships um, leading hundreds of pirates throughout the Atlantic, even going as far as the west coast of Africa. But in general, a very large pirate fleet like this, it was quite rare. So in this scene, we see three historical pirates. We see the female pirate Anne Bonny, we see Jack Rackham, and we see Edward Teach, commonly known as Blackbeard. All three of these pirates did exist, very much so during the Golden Age of Piracy. Anne Bonny and Jack Rackham sailed together. She and Jack Rackham never sailed with Blackbeard. We see Anne Bonny and several other pirates go with her into one of these Navy ships to kind of start their attack. So you kind of did divvy up pirate crews, those who would stay on their own ship and fight, and then those who would go onto the ship that they were trying to capture in order to fight. Anne Bonny probably would have stayed on her own ship being a woman, but she would have massively participated in the battle. Survivors of attacks and hostages later testified at the trial that Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, they fought just as much as the men did, wearing men's clothing. So we do get a lot of that historical accuracy kind of coming in. I'll give this clip a seven. So what's interesting here is that we're seeing unwanted posters about specific pirates. Now, manhunts for pirates weren't very common, and this is because it was pretty rare for government to throw so many resources into capturing one specific pirate. There's really only two cases during the Golden Age of Piracy that we see manhunts. One for the pirate Henry Avery and one for the pirate Captain Kidd. They both operated in the Indian Ocean in the 1690s. Captain Henry Avery initiated a mutiny on his ship and then became a pirate, and they were fighting against major Indian Mughal ships. The Mughal Empire, which had a trading relationship with the British East India Company, was very threatened, and they threatened to cut off all trade unless the British could capture Henry Avery. Unfortunately, Henry Avery disappears in history, so the British were never able to capture him. What can I do for you, Vice Admiral? I have a request for you. One that suits your particular talents. A young upstart named Luffy. So in this scene, we see the Marine Admiral who has hired a pirate to basically work for him. This was common. And these pirates were called privateers. A privateer, in a way, was a pirate for hire. They would work for a specific government. And in payment, they were allowed to keep about 80% of all the goods they could steal. As long as the ships they captured were the ones they were supposed to, they could go anywhere they wanted. So, yes, it was pretty common for a lot of pirates to either start their career working as a privateer or decide to finish their pirate career by becoming a privateer. In terms of realism, I would give this about 6 out of 10. This is not accurate to reality at all. Pirates were not known to feed people to any sort of animals. Now, there were a couple of extremely brutal pirates, George Lowther and Ned Lowe, who sailed in like the late 1710s and early 1720s. And they were known to really brutalize their victims by cutting off body parts, such as maybe their ears, part of the nose or their lips. And they reportedly would broil some of these parts and force their victims to eat their own body parts. These are the only two cases that I have seen where this has happened. And it was very much, again, the exception to the rule. And these stories very well may have been exaggerated because we only know so much about what actually happened on a pirate ship. But pirates never fed any victims to any animals. They're fighting against pirates who look to be land-based. They're, in, they're not fighting these pirates at sea. They're fighting them in their pirate stronghold. Now, during the Golden Age of Piracy, in the early stages from about like 1650 until about the 1670s, we do see a lot of land-based pirates known as buccaneers. And a lot of them were initially French pirates who were exacting revenge against the Spanish. They had a lot of rivalry in terms of plantation islands during that time. And so that is something kind of interesting to know is that they're taking sort of a detail, possibly from the early stages of the golden age of piracy here, being that they are pirates fighting on land rather than at sea. 
Well, another thing to note is that the captain, he's not really engaging in battle very much. He's not fighting with the crew. That's common. Pirate captains were the ones to oversee the battle. They were the ones giving the orders. I would give this clip a one out of 10. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing accurate in this at all. So in this scene, we're seeing Armando Salazar, who is a captain of the Spanish Navy, and he is going after these pirates. And his job basically is to be a pirate hunter. And this wasn't a very common job, but it was a known job to have. And very particular skilled sailors, often veterans of war or maybe people who had once been pirates, would become pirate hunters. But there just weren't very many so in terms of how effective they were, they weren't necessarily the most effective way to get rid of pirates. Another thing to note about this is that Salazar is part of a royal navy. So while we do have a lot of pirate hunters, it's pretty unlikely that the navy is going to send a major ship or a fleet to go after pirates. That would not have happened. They outsourced that. This was an interesting pirate battle to watch because we're seeing a typical pirate ship, which is a sloop, kind of a single level ship um, with a handful of cannons versus a very large ship, like a man of war ship. And what's interesting is that the pirates do manage to win this battle. And a lot of it has to do because of each ship's size. Pirate ships generally often tended to be smaller so that way they could sail in more dangerous locations a lot more effectively. So they can get through uh, a lot narrow, narrower places. They can kind of dodge a lot of rocks and that sort of thing. Whereas a large ship, while it's more powerful in terms of weaponry, it, they're not going to be able to maneuver around those types of areas very well at all. And this is what, they, what we see. They enter into a dangerous area. And even though it's a large, powerful ship, its size prevents it from being able to maneuver into safety. I would give this clip a 6 out of 10. My favorite pirate movie of all time is Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. I think they get a lot of history correct in there. They take a lot of maritime mythology, such as kind of ghosts at sea, sailors being afraid of the water, and then they get lots of other cultural elements correct in terms of how pirate ships were. And plus, it's just a really fun movie. So Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl, hands down. Thanks for watching. If you were hooked, why not swing over to the next video?